I'm Charlie Comstock of Model Railroad Hobbyist Magazine, and I'm underneath the Hobby Smith Hobby Store in the train room of the Columbia River N Scale Club. And you guys are a modular N track club. And, uh, and you, can I get your names? I'm David Waterstreet. I'm Dallas Tyhurst. Well, thank you very much for having me. What was it that uh, the, the club is N scale and N track? What, what is it about N scale and N track that attracted you? Well, for one thing, I saw a layout many years ago, and I was impressed with the fact that you have such small trains and such a huge amount of scenery that looks real. You can't do that in a lot of other scales because you need much bigger scenery. Here it just seems to fit. We get a lot more trains in, a lot more running, and a lot more switching. And just, it just seems like the right scale for us. You get a better ratio of uh, track to scenery is, is one of the big things that started it. Well, what is it that, uh, are, are there any problems with N-Scale or any track things that you don't like? The biggest problem a lot of folks talk about is simply the size of it, and particularly with a lot of the modelers who are older modelers, uh, and our fat arthritic fingers gets harder and harder to handle the real small trains. But uh, with, with a little bit of finesse, uh, you can work through that, and it's just how much attention you want to pay to detail in the small scale. Uh, but we've got every much as detail, I think, as the uh, HO, HO modelers do in our in-scale uh, equipment and running stock, layouts, that sort of thing. But it's a finer scale, and you have to be uh, a little more careful with what you're doing and how you're modeling and, uh, and the details that you can achieve. And then the model, uh, model railroad manufacturers have come a long way in the last 15 years. You know, there's an in-scale revolution going on. Yeah, there is. you can start really to is. see a lot more stuff coming out to help us. And they're actually kind of jumping on the bandwagon a little bit. It makes it nice for us because InScale was kind of like a stepchild for a long time. AJO had everything. Now it's starting to pick up. It makes our job a lot easier. Uh, what sets you guys apart with your N-Track modules from other N-Track clubs? Probably the biggest thing is uh, where we are. You know, we're in the gorgeous Columbia Gorge here in Oregon, and we've got just absolutely tremendous prototypical scenery to model which is what the, uh, the name of the club, you know, goes after, is uh, the Columbia Gorge here in Oregon. And uh, we certainly uh, have got a lot of just beautiful natural scenery uh, to model and, uh, and emulate, which is what we've tried to do here on our modules. And as Dallas was saying, uh, people that know the area and have traveled the gorge will recognize scenes that we've captured here on the layout. And now that you've got all these modules put together, uh is there anything that you've learned that uh, you uh, would have you would have done things differently when you were uh, doing the building? Well, the one thing for sure that we learned was every module used to have individual lakes, one on every corner of the module, and that was so long in taking down and putting up that we agreed uh, agreed to put in what they call pocket lakes. They're standardized; they have pockets. You just put the the module on the legs you're done. Is there anything special you're doing in module construction for rigidity and lightweight or any, uh, anything that isn't standard for that? Well, we kind of continue to use uh, foam, foam core board, whatever it takes to make scenery. it real light. Like foam core board? Sure, where we need it. Roads. Oh, you use foam core up for a flat surface? Yeah. Then okay. we use uh, pink foam or white foam for scenery and anything to make it lightweight, obviously, so we don't have to kill ourselves moving it. Or is there plaster here? Or the is basic, it, uh, there's, there's plaster. Or is it that Joel Bragdon geodesic foam stuff? We've um, experimented with that a little bit. We haven't gone, because uh, this is, again, most of these modules are, uh, are a number of years old. We haven't gotten into that yet, but we are experimenting with that and have on uh, a couple of instances, but we haven't gone full scale Is that, that working well for you? Uh, I've done a number of layouts uh, using that, and it works very well, and I'm very enthusiastic about it. How's the cost of that compared with traditional plaster? My experience is the raw materials tend to be a, a little more expensive, but the time that you save in doing that, um, I think, exceeds the, uh, the additional, or the, the cost savings you would have in traditional plaster. Plus, it's flexibility. It, it's flexibility. Flexibility that you can... Uh, take the uh, molds when the, when, the, when the rocks or the, uh, uh, the cast hard shell that you use as a foundation comes out of the mold, it has a tre tremendous elasticity to it. And so you can mold it. You can, by mold it, I mean by form it. You can shape it in the 
any kind of a shape that you want of with it with the rocks already cast into it. So you can you can shape it into a ravine. You can shape it into a, an outcrop of, of, of sort. What about the uh, water? Basically what we do to start with is we, we do our landforms where we plan on having the water. We smooth it down as much as we can. Then we come around with joint compound. We spread it, get it everywhere we want to go. Then we get a wet sponge, wet it on the edge, and make little waves all the way through. As many as we want, as often and as high as we want by using the sponge. And we let that dry. When we come back, we paint it, light around the small edges, darker in the middle or deepness. And then we let that dry for a few days, make sure it's correct, not cracked. And we do, we repair it, then we gloss coat it. And then here, just what it looks like as a finished product. 